out is that we have to be, as the word says, equally yoked. So God's issue was that marriage to someone who does not believe in the same God might cause you to stop believing in your God. Amen. So he was very clear that when you marry, marry someone who is like-minded. It doesn't mean you have to think the same. But it does mean that as far as your beliefs in the God that you serve, that you are on one accord. So as the text begins, it says here that Ezra prayed and made confessions, weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God. A very great assembly of men and women and children gathered to him out of Israel. And the people also wept bitterly. This is interesting because... Uh, he finds himself in a very difficult situation. And I want you to notice that it was not um, Ezra's preaching ability that gathered the people to Ezra. It was because Ezra prayed that got the people's attention. One of the things that we must realize is that when we know the things of God, when God has laid something on our heart, we must learn not to talk ourselves out of doing the right thing. What I classify that is as is self-sabotage. It shows up in our thoughts, our behaviors, and one of the things we must understand is that self-sabotage tries to undermine our best interest or our conscious intentions. Paul said it like this, to make it very plain, in Romans chapter 7, verses 19 through 20. Paul says, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want to do. If I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. Paul said, I know the right thing to do, but I struggle doing the right thing because the wrong thing keeps trying to make me do what I want to do. So those are what I call self-defeating habits. And what Ezra highlights here is that the people had found themselves in a place that they kept doing the things they wanted to do instead of the things God was calling them to do. And isn't that just like us as far as humanity? The things that are easy, the things that are pleasurable, the things that, that are just natural to us, we just want to do them. But I learned in this short life of mine that the easy road is not always the best road. Chapter 9 points for us that they have a problem. Chapter 10 says that not only do I have an issue, but chapter 10 says, I'm going to do something about it. The people in chapter 10, I'm going to tell you the end of the story before we deal with the beginning of the story. The people recommit themselves back to God. And they do away with the things that hinder their relationship with God. So our job today is to really look at how did they take the steps to recommit themselves back to God. First, you have to be open to listen to wise counsel. As we're praying, he made confession. But notice something, after he prays, it prompts the people to participate. One of the key lessons is that before we can do anything, prayer needs to be our foundation. Prayer is like tilling the ground. I think I've said this when I first got here. I'm a country boy. I grew up in uh, North Carolina. And one of the benefits of growing up in uh, the country is that my grandfather possessed a lot of land and he had gardens everywhere. So I learned the importance of tilling the ground. In order for something to produce, in order for something to grow, you had to prepare the ground. You couldn't just throw the seed on top of the ground. 
<laughs> you had to till the ground, meaning to unearth the earth, the dirt, so that something could take root and grow. And prayer does that. It tills the ground so that God can begin to work in our hearts. It tills the ground so God can begin to move in our situations. It tills the ground so that God can begin to show how great and mighty God is. If, if I can put it in a more younger context, prayer is like sliding in the DMs of God. For my senior saints, you may say, what is a DM? <laughs> DM is a direct message. It means that instead of, if you use Facebook, instead of putting a post that you talk to everybody, it is a direct message to an individual that you may not want to share with everybody else. So with prayer, it is direct communication with God. To say, God, these are the things that are on my mind. These are the things that are on my heart. It is direct uh, communication with someone. So what God does in this text is that after Ezra prays in verse number two, we see a gentleman introduced to us by the name of Shechaniah. Shechaniah means dweller with Jehovah. He's one that speaks directly to the issue. Now, what's significant is we hear nothing else about Shechaniah. He's not a known person like Daniel. We don't know much about him or where he comes from. But God uses Shechaniah in this moment because it says to us that you don't always have to be in humanity's viewpoint a significant individual. But God can use anybody. Amen. And here is what we learn is that at this moment, Shechaniah speaks up and says to the people and to Ezra, he says, we have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the people of the land. But even now, here it is, there is hope Amen. for Israel in spite of this. Yeah. So it says to us that even when we find ourselves in places that may not always be the best for us, that there is hope in the situation in spite of what we go through and in spite of what we deal with. Shechaniah speaks to the issue, and he says to them, if we want to uh, build our relationship back with God, there are some things that we're going to have to do, which leads me to my second point. The second point is, know that temporary situations, or excuse me, know that temporary solutions are not satisfactory. We cannot, uh, as I like to say, patch things. Some stuff, you know, you just got to fix. Because if we simply just put a Band-Aid over certain things, it will never heal. And Shechaniah said to the people, I recognize the severity of the sin. And in order for us to regain our relationship back to God, there's some things we're just going to have to do away with. There's some ways we're going to have to change. There's some mindsets that are going to have to be renewed. Because sometimes we have to learn how to get past those things that simply satisfy us and ask ourselves the question, does it satisfy God? Mm -hmm. And so he says that there's hope in the situation, but we need to make a covenant with God so that we can return back to God. So he says we must learn how to do away with some things. I like to say it like this. Sometimes you, not, you cannot suspend things you must expel it. Amen. Amen. Some stuff you just have to do away with. I learned a while ago, especially from my mother, she would tell me, listen, there's something you can get away with. I may not see you do it, but God sees everything. She said, but here's the other side of it. I may not catch you in it, but it will come back around. Amen. And I'll find out anyway. That's right. And this is the lesson I think that Ezra's trying to tell the people of Shechaniah is telling them. He was saying, God has allowed us to dwell in it for so long that we have become comfortable with it. 
But he says to them, when does comfort move into the place of conviction? That God begins to work on our hearts to say that there's something that I'm not comfortable with. And this is what Shechaniah has to remind the people. God is moving us to a place that he's beginning to work on our heart to show us that there are some things that we just need to change. Yeah, we in a new year. And most people, uh, they create these lists of New Year's resolutions. <laughs> if y'all know it. <laughs> One of the things that fascinates me is research shows that most people stick to their New Year's resolutions maybe a good 